Good morning. I'm William W. McKinney, the archives of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons has asked me to give you some of my background, training, and experiences in medicine. I am descended from third generation Texans on both sides of my family and was born in Galveston, Texas, October the 23rd, 1911. My father was a pioneer in the natural gas business and was one of the founders of the Houston Natural Gas Company. We moved a lot to Biloxi, Mississippi, then to Denison, Texas, and to Dallas in 1918, where I attended grammar school. In 1924, we moved to Houston, where I attended San Jacinto High School and graduated from Rice University in 1933. I returned to Galveston for medical school at the University of Texas, graduating in 1937. During my senior year in medical school, I was privileged to work with an outstanding general surgeon in Houston, Texas. Dr. Frank L. Barnes. His surgical technique and patient care were an inspiration, and I decided to seek a straight surgical internship rather than a rotating internship. An appointment to the surgical service at Baltimore City Hospital was the result. Dr. Arthur Shipley was chief of surgery and professor of surgery at the University of Maryland. Other staff members were from the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins University. We had a tremendous reservoir of pathology and acute trauma. It was an excellent service. Dr. Otto Brannigan was the chief surgical resident and the interns were from all over the United States. We rotated through all the surgical specialties and were exposed to a lot of emergency room problems. Thoracic surgery was coming into being. Thoracoplasty was probably our most common procedure. Burns were common and were treated with compression dressings, silver nitrate, and pinch grafts. Pinch grafts did a fair job of covering the burn areas, but led to some unsightly results. In 1937 and 8, we had only sulfur drugs, no penicillin or any of the wonder drugs that came along later. Consequently, we had many infections that were difficult. Probably the most important resource the service offered was the variety of pathology pathological conditions that we could be that could be found in the chronic hospital tumors and cancers in all stages it was like a huge textbook after one year at baltimore city hospital dr arthur shipley invited me to join this program at the University of Maryland. This was unusual because all of the interns and residents up to that time were chosen from the graduates of the Medical School of Maryland. Two months after I arrived at the University Hospital, Dr. Bill Patton, who was the resident in surgery assigned to the Orthopedic and Neurosurgical Services, left to join the neurosurgical program at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Shipley assigned me to his duties. My experience on these two services was very interesting. They both had active training services and a goodly amount of elective surgery. Dr. Charles Bagley, the chief of neurosurgery at was one of the of Harvey Cushing's first residents. He was a small man with a great deal of energy. His rapport with patients was his outstanding quality. They developed complete confidence in his ability to give them the best possible care. He was not the best surgeon, 
but was very successful in managing head injuries. In June of 1939, just before the end of the resident year, Dr. Bagley asked me to stay on in neurosurgery. My first reaction was to decline. I was more interested in general surgery, and at that time, there was a high mortality rate in neurosurgery. Dr. James Arnold, the neurologist for Dr. Bagley's group, was planning to go into the neurosurgical training program. He persuaded me to accept the appointment and help build the service. This was be the beginning of a long and fruitful relationship. Neurosurgery was really in its infancy. The first round of neurosurgeons was mature. Doctors Cushing, Dandy, Grant, Knapsiger, Pete, Adson, Penfield, Ellsberg, Sachs, Mixter, Sims, and Coleman. Their first residents were taking over and I was in the second flight, but it was still a very small field before World War II. My next year and a half at the University of Maryland was very fulfilling. I was extremely busy, no official time off. Once I went three months without leaving the hospital. Another interesting bit of information, we received no pay, except our board and room and white uniforms. It did prepare us for the Army and the early days of private practice. During my tenure at the University of Maryland, I did some early work on cerebral angiography and psychosurgery. I began experimenting with, experimenting with cerebral angiograph, angiography in 1939. Dr. Moniz of Portugal reported the first use of cerebral arteriography for localization of cerebral tumors in 1927, but it was not popularized in the United States until after the war in the late 40s. Dr. Lohman and Meyerson were doing some cerebral circulation studies on patients in the Massachusetts State Mental Hospital in 1939. I was interested in their method of injection of the carotid artery percutaneous and their serial x-ray technique. I visited with them and they provided me with the necessary information to do some studies of my own at the University of Maryland. It was in the clinic that I perfected my technique of percutaneous puncturing of the common carotid artery. Then I began doing arteriograms in the hospital using simple cassette changers for serial uh, films of sodium iodide as it flowed through the cerebral circulation. It was probably some of the earliest work done in the United States. Not long after this, I moved to the New York Neurological Institute. I talked Dr. Byron Stuckey and Dr. Dyke into letting me do an arteriogram on one of their private patients who was suspected of having a cerebral vascular abnormality. They were very apprehensive and stood over me watching with bated breath. I successfully punctured the common carotid and was ready to make the injection when suddenly Dr. Dyke decided to adjust the patient's head. In doing so, he caused the needle to slip out of the artery. They were so nervous that they made me stop, and that was the end of cerebral arteriography at the Institute for several years. This is typical of what can happen to new procedures in medicine. Another project that I was interested in in 1939 was leucotomy for certain psychoses. Dr. Igus Moniz first described this method of making a destructive lesion in portions of the white matter in the frontal lobes 
by means of alcohol injection. Dr. Freeman and Watts in Washington, D.C. were doing quite a bit of this psychosurgery in 1939, and I had an opportunity to observe their work and was able to duplicate their results at the University of Maryland. Dr. William Scoville spent about six months with us at the university during his, uni during his residency training and was exposed to this early work in prefrontal lobotomy. He returned to Hartford, Connecticut and later did extensive work in this field. My interest in stereotaxis began in 1958 when a patient with severe Parkinson's disease was presented. Her husband had heard of the work of Dr. Irving Cooper and wanted me to do the operation in Fort Worth. I had heard Dr. Cooper speak on the subject at a recent meeting, so I paid him a visit. I observed the procedure in which he injected alcohol into the region of the globus pallidus. On the same visit, I watched Dr. Tom Hohen do an anterior choroidal artery ligation, the first procedure that Dr. Cooper did to relieve the symptoms of Parkinsonism. Cooper's results were dramatic. He was gradually shifting to the alcohol injection from the artery ligation. I returned to Fort Worth and did an anterior choroidal artery ligation on my patient and obtained a good result. In fact, it was so it went so well that I did six other cases. The operation was a big procedure for these weak debilitated patients. Even though my results were very good, I felt that, felt that the alcohol injection done under local anesthesia would be preferable. My first alcohol injections were done by the temporal approach following Cooper's technique. After doing about 15 cases in this manner, I changed the approach to an opening two and a half centimeters lateral to the midline and just anterior to the coronal suture. I am reasonably sure that I was the first to use this vertical approach, but failed to report it. Over the next year and a half, I did approximately 100 cases using the alcohol technique. In a few cases, I am sure there was some diffusion of the alcohol and the adjacent basal ganglia were affected. In other words, we could not always control the amount of destruction that the alcohol may produce. Although I was fortunate not to have any severe side effects, I decided to make my lesions with the leukotome so that I could control the size and shape of the lesion. I had to design a method to guide and hold my leukotome. With the help of two fine machinists, Stanley Noska and Robert Hasty, I was able to make an instrument that tapped into a 5 8 inch drill hole made by a Dorico drill. It was firmly attached to the skull, conical in shape, with a platform similar to a microscope stage so that a guide cylinder could be positioned in any direction with a graduated scale. The depth of the leukotome was controlled by a collet. The leukotome itself was 15 centimeters long and had a slot in the slide of a 1.5 millimeter tube that permitted a high tensile steel wire to extend to a loop in a loop fashion to five millimeters. The size of the loop was controlled by a micrometer at the end of the tube. As I said, the size of the loop could be controlled so that it could be extended from one to five millimeters. Once the loop was open, the desired amount, the leukotome was rotated 45 degrees right 
and 45 degrees left. The loop was then retracted and the leukotome rotated to the next quadrant and again the loop extruded the desired amount. This procedure was continued until all four quadrants were cut. We were able to show by x-ray where the lesions were made and record them, particularly in reference to the ventricular system, the anterior and posterior commissure. By limiting the cuts to 90 degrees, I felt that we substantially reduced the chance of tearing a blood vessel. Positioning was determined by the ventricles, the anterior and posterior commissures. We could get excellent filling of the ventricles by tapping the lateral ventricle through the burr hole used for attachment of the stereotactic table. I found that it was that by injecting 10 cc's of air without withdrawing ventricular fluid and holding the pressure while the lateral film was taken, the anterior half of the lateral and third ventricles would fill 95% of the time with good visualization of the foramen of Monroe and the two commissures. The pressure would be released immediately after the x-ray was taken, thus relieving most of the discomfort the patient had from the air. Most of my lesions were made 15 millimeters lateral to the midline and 15 millimeters posterior to the anterior commissure on a line from the anterior to the posterior commissure. My results were most gratifying and over the period from 1958 to 1972, I did 1,500 operations. My patients came from all over the United States, Mexico, and a few from South America. The volume turned my very diversified neurosurgical practice into a very restricted specialty. I used to pride myself in working in all parts of the body. One day I was doing a lumbar sympathectomy when a general surgeon friend of mine came in to watch. He remarked, Bill, there is no telling where you might be working. In the early 1960s, Dr. Harold Shelley was doing a lot of vein stripping for varicose veins, asked me to do a series of lumbar sympathectomies on his patients. I used a lateral muscle splitting extraperitoneal approach to the lumbar sympathetic chain and became so proficient that I could occasionally do a skin-to-skin -skin procedure in 15 minutes. During this active period of stereotaxis, I came in contact with Dr. Spiegel and Weisses in, Mex in Philadelphia, who used a modified horsley stereotactic instrument and did some beautiful work outlining the basal ganglia and anatomy of the area. Dr. Russell Meyer in Iowa had probably the most unusual method of making a lesion. He did a fairly large craniotomy, exposed almost one whole hemisphere, and fitted a conical basin over the area, which was filled with saline to a depth of four to six inches. He then had an ultrasonic equipment that extended over the operating table up to a second floor level to make an ultrasonic lesion at the convergence of four beams. Dr. Robert Heimberger, chief of neurosurgery at the University of Indiana, also had another very large stereotactic machine to make primarily electrolytic lesions. Dr. John Gillingham of Edinburgh, Scotland, used an, an occipital approach to the thalamus using electronic equipment to sound record his progress through the brain. After the use of alcohol, Cooper started making lesions with a cryosurgical unit. A 2.5 millimeter probe was inserted through a burr hole 
in the frontal bone just anterior to the coronal suture and two and a half millimeters lateral to the midline. The tip of the probe was used to form an ice ball, roughly one centimeter in diameter. This procedure became fairly popular. All of the procedures described involved use of some very sophisticated equipment and x-ray. It was costly and only fairly large centers could afford to have them. The instrument I designed was not expensive and could be used in a general hospital with average x-ray equipment. I believe I was able to place my lesion just as accurately as the others, and by using a leucotome, I could shape the lesion to fit the case. Out of 1,500 operations, I had only seven deaths, and my morbidity was as low as any other series. Many neurosurgeons were able to duplicate my results with this instrument, and it was widely used. Dr. Paul Busey paid me a visit and used the equipment, which to me was a compliment, considering his wide experience in this type of work. All of my patients were operated on under local anesthesia with, the, with a few exceptions one of which was a Catholic sister. She was so nervous and just couldn't accept a local, and we had to give her a general anesthetic. I had some fun with her later, since she had a good result, questioning her religious beliefs and accusing her of not having enough faith in the Lord. About 1965, I became interested in doing particular pituitary ablation stereotactically by the transphenoidal approach and using a cryosurgical unit. While visiting in Germany at the International Neurosurgical Meeting in 1967, I discussed with Dr. Robert Rand his technique for pituitary ablation. I made arrangements with him to call me when he had a case to do. I went to Los Angeles and observed his work. It was well done, but impractical from the standpoint of the time involved, almost an entire day to do one case. The cost alone would be impossible in general practice. I gave up the idea until I talked to Dr. Garber Galbus in Birmingham, Alabama. He was doing a fair number of these cases, so I observed his work. He did the procedure using one lesion, and it took about one and a half hours. My enthusiasm returned. On my way back on the plane, I designed a new stereotactic instrument, incorporating some of the functions of the Toddwell instrument. These changes enabled me to utilize my type of x-ray installed in my operating room. Again, Nasca and Hasty converted my thoughts and ideas to steel. Together we produced a very good instrument that utilized the cryosurgical method of making a lesion going through the nasal canal up through the sphenoid sinus and the base of the cella tersica into the pituitary gland. I did a goodly number of these cases with no fatalities and very satisfactory results. Dr. Ralph Clowett visited with me in 1958 and demonstrated the anterior cervical disc removal with bone fusion. This was a rather new approach, but he had been doing the procedure for some time. It appealed to me and I began using it with satisfactory results, particularly in spondylosis and foraminal encroachment. For routine herniated cervical discs, I felt the posterior approach was much preferable. Donor bone was taken from the ilium, but my patients had so much discomfort at the donor site that I started taking plugs of bone from the sternum that worked very well. 
I also used bank bone taken from the skull. In 1941, I was assigned the position of neurosurgeon in the University of Maryland Hospital Unit of the Army Medical Corps. When war was declared, I was in New York City attending a pro football game with Dr. Harold Kirkham, who was the chief plastic surgeon for the Navy. He promptly offered me a neurosurgical position at the San Diego Naval Hospital. We made some efforts to get the transfer, but the Army would not consider releasing me. In March of 1942, when the University of Maryland unit was activated, we were reported to Fort Riley, Kansas, where we were organized and equipped. We were then shipped to San Francisco for 10 days and boarded the USS Grant April 15th, destination unknown. We arrived in Auckland, New Zealand about two weeks later. There we paraded down the main street with the 37th Division, the first troops from the United States. Ten days later, we boarded ship again and went to Suva, Fiji. As we were docking, I got a call to report to the captain's quarters. There was a U.S. airman in Latoka across the island at the air base who was becoming progressively paralyzed. We quickly gathered instruments and I was on my way within an hour. On arrival at the air base dispensary, I found a 22-year-old with a complete paralysis from the nipple down, with fever and elevated white blood count. After a view of his history and a careful examination, I concluded that he could have an epidural spinal abscess. As soon as possible, we rigged an operating room in a warehouse, and I opened the spine under most primitive conditions, but was delighted to find that my diagnosis was correct. The only antibiotic we had was sulfonilamide. I filled the wound with the drug and packed it open. Thirty days later, the airman was shipped home, having regained practically all of his neurological function. This was a great beginning. We stayed in Fiji for two years and had some very busy periods whenever a boatload of casualties would be brought in from Guadalcanal. Dr. John Finney was the chief surgeon at, of the Hopkins unit and also the chief medical officer of the area. He decided to send a neurosurgeon to Guadalcanal. Charlie Trollin was a neurosurgeon in the Hopkins unit, and Dr. Finney called us together and asked for a volunteer. We both wanted to go, so he flipped a coin and Charlie won. He went to Guadalcanal and spent about six weeks, but found that it was impractical. We just did not have the equipment and facilities necessary to work in a combat area. It was not until the Korean conflict that such equipment and facilities became available. Dr. Arnold Morawski has written much about that period. Gradually, the volume of casualties dwindled and we became a staging area. I did some general surgery to keep busy and also worked in the civilian hospital in Suva. One interesting case was a huge meningioma in a Fijian policeman. It came out nicely and I was a local success. In May of 1944, I returned to the States because I was not being utilized. At that time, there was a scarcity of neurosurgeons and they were badly needed for treatment of all the casualties returning from Europe. I was assigned to the Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. Dr. R.C.L. Robertson was chief of neurosurgery. In October 1944, I went to Glennon General Hospital in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, where there were many German prisoners of war with neurological problems. <laughs> 
It was interesting to use some of the German prisoners who were doctors. I was surprised at their rather poor surgical training. Most of the work was on cranial defects and peripheral nerve injuries, and we used tantalum plate for repairing the cranial defects. I worked out a substantial percentage of the cases in a three-month period. This was a small town and there was little to do but work. However, during that time I took flying lessons and got my license. After the war, when I had returned to my home in Houston, I used the airplane for trips to surrounding towns and cities doing consultations. I thoroughly enjoyed flying. Progressing through the various licenses and from single engine to multi engine planes until open heart surgery in 1974 grounded me. In January of 1945, Dr. Robertson was transferred to Richmond, Virginia, and I went back to Fort Sam Houston as chief of neurosurgery. General Beach gave me a house on the post which was a real plum. He said I would spend the remainder of the war at this hospital. One week later, the powers in Washington decided to form large neurosurgical centers, and I was transferred to McGuire General Hospital in Richmond, Virginia, with Bob Robertson and Charles Trowan. We had five general surgeons who had gone through a six months training course in neurosurgery assigned to the group. Two of these men after the war took formal neurosurgical training, Dr. Charles Neal and Dr. William Peacher. McGuire General Hospital was an orthopedic and neurosurgical center. There were about 2,000 beds. Many of the patients were in for treatment and sent home for periods of convalescence and would return for additional surgery or treatment. We had about 2,500 neurosurgical cases. The majority were peripheral nerve injuries. There was one building housing 100 paraplegic cases. The operation load was tremendous. We worked five days a week in the operating room from 5, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Rounds were made on post-operative and pre-operative patients after work in the operating room. All the, all the work was secondary and involved a section through dense scar tissue making a slow and laborious procedure. End to end anastomosis of the nerves was done with fine tantalum wire. We had no operating microscopes, no loops, but youthful eyes were a big help. Many of the cases had to be put in casts so that we could hold and relieve the tension on the anastomosis. The second most common neurosurgical lesion was cranial defects. These afforded a real challenge, particularly where the supraorbital ridges and sinuses were destroyed. Fashioning a tantalum plate to fit these defects was interesting work. Care and treatment of the paraplegic cases was quite a job, involving a lot of psychology, urology, and physiotherapy. The 15 months I spent there was very fruitful, but I didn't care to ever see another peripheral nerve injury. I was discharged a lieutenant colonel and agreed to stay in the reserve for five years. They offered to make me a full colonel if I would stay in active service, but I had had enough army. I returned to my home in Houston. Housing and office space were practically non-existent. So we moved in with the family and my brother-in-law Peyton Barnes, a general surgeon, made space for me in his office. <clears throat> it was strange to be charging fees for my services for the first time in 17 years since I began my training in college. 
I received appointments at all the hospitals and Baylor University Medical School. There were six neurosurgeons in Houston in 1946, some of whom were Jim Greenwood, Keith Bradford, and Bob Robertson. My volume of work steadily increased. In the spring of 1947, a group from Fort Worth asked me to consider moving there. Although Houston had been my home since 1925, I never liked the climate and was away long enough to realize there were better places to live. I decided to make the move, and in August of 1947, I opened my office in Fort Worth. My work was primarily acute trauma at first. I suppose this is true with most neurosurgeons. The resident doctors have to try you out. Gradually, my work became mostly elective. I did every type of neurosurgery in all, involving all parts of the body. Sympathectomies for hypertension were popular for several years, and I began with the Smithwick operation for removal of the thoracic sympathetic chain. This was a peephole operation. With such restricted exposure that if troublesome bleeding occurred, it was a problem. For this reason, I began using the Grimson technique where a rib was resected and a wide exposure of the thoracic cavity gave one good visualization of the sympathetic chain. The operation could be done with much more dispatch and certainty. Spinal surgery was one of my favorite areas, and I did a goodly number of tumors and disc operations. Aneurysms and intracranial tumors were fairly common. We did some arterial malformations, but relatively few. Most of my work was done before the operating microscope was used. The otologists were the first in Fort Worth area to use the operating microscope. Our only diagnostic aids were arteriograms and pneumoencephalograms. CAT scans and MRIs were not in place. A good neurological examination with detailed history was the basis for much of our diagnosis. A small malignant tumor with a lot of swelling could present a tremendous problem and could occasionally be missed. Anesthesiology in Fort Worth in 1947 was done by nurses with limited knowledge. This was one of my biggest problems. After one very sad experience, I decided to do all my cases under local anesthesia until we could get some well-trained anesthesiologists. Fortunately, this was not too long. I was busy from the day I arrived in Fort Worth and continued so until March the 23rd, 1973, when I was forced to retire because of severe coronary artery disease. I was told that surgery would not help. My angina became progressively worse and on July the 17th, 1974, a bypass was done. The left coronary was 85% occluded and the right 90% occluded, and the circumflex was completely closed. Following surgery, I did wonderfully well and have continued to be moderately active and have felt good ever since. Retirement is something that Busy doctors sometimes look forward to with much anticipation. If one is in good health and feels well, time soon begins to drag. Travel, golf, fishing, and so forth fail to take the place of medicine. I have found that it is extremely important to stay busy doing something productive that you enjoy. I remained busy and active for 12 years, then time began to hang heavy. Dr. Forrest Barber called me one day and asked me to consider working as a consultant for his neurosurgical instrument company, Midas Rex. It had been a long time since I had been active in medicine and I was reluctant. He urged me to give it a try. 
I agreed and have thoroughly enjoyed working once again, being in contact with doctors all over the United States and Canada. Thank you.